Okay, so previously when we largely talked to get terms out of the way, we talked about Shokan and Tensei and not okay, but one of the things we ended up missing was Tenni or transfer-focused isekai, where characters move from one place to another instead of being summoned or reincarnated. And this is actually kind of important because in this context there are actually some pretty interesting implications, and one of the big works that came out in recent years was gay. Yeah, Gate is maybe one of the most famous tenin right now. Uh, we have two seasons in anime, we have a manga, it's pretty well sold, and uh, it's completely Japan propaganda for Jietai. So do you think it's doing something unique, or is this just innate to Isekai? It's absolutely about politics in a way. Uh, Gate is one of the most famous, but before Gate, we already have uh, Isekai that promote Japan in Overworld like uh, Outbreak Company, you know, with uh, a main character who's an otaku, like the main character in Gate, and is transported uh, by the government to another world to promote the otaku culture in this world to sell them shit. In Gate, it's uh, like a pretext uh, of, of the Japan to invade uh, this overworld, is just uh, they attack first. <laughs> they don't just decide it's uh, an error or not. And uh, in Gate, we have uh, a main character who's uh, an otaku, right? But uh, it's also a military. And he decides to be uh, militarized to uh, an empire of middle age, fantasy with dragons and stuff. And Japan Jedi come with Apache helicopter and stuff and they shoot in the in the bullet in the eye. Yeah, you're, uh, you're almighty god and you scratch uh, hands with your fingers. It's like a, an, uh, a slaughter. One of the notable things about Gate is that it adopts a really defensive position. When we think of Isekai, they feel very proactive in that people seek out new worlds or they explore, but for Gate, the impetus is fundamentally determined by something that happens to them. And it's a sort of constitutional anxiety, given that Japan's constitution was largely written by the Americans, so among them being the inability to field their own interests through military projection, and that ends up fundamentally informing the logics of these sorts of stories. Even outside the Isekai world, uh, some, some stories uh, in manga and anime will try to talk about uh, the influence of Japan to, uh, to the overworld. Even if that's uh, something that reminds me of uh, Gate, is like Zipang, where a cruiser uh, boat from uh, our era was transported into uh, World War II, and they decide, or not, to uh, involve in the conflict with maybe change the, the story of Japan and potentially stop this, this war before or uh, prevent Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's not Kaizole, you know, it's not isolated. It's in the mind of uh, a lot of stories in Japan because Japan is, even if we, we don't see it like this, it's, it's pretty far right. The kindergarten's principal believes in rewriting significant events in Japan's history. When you when you see uh, the politics of Shinzo Abe, he has a repercussion in this culture, and we see it in, even in Isekai. That was Gate, in where they decide to install guns in another world, like in Gunota or Manuke, and even for knowledge, where they decide to. When we have uh, an Isekai about a guy we have not uh, a military power, but as a, a knowledge, particularly in his mind. Like with a veterinarian in Juisa no Shigoto, Isekai Yakoku, whose main character is a pharmacist. So he brings uh, his knowledge of, of medicine in this overworld of middle age and that improve and change this drastically this world. These kind of stories are, are not uh, uncommon in Isekai. I think there's actually something you touch upon which is really worth noting, and that is that when the Japanese get involved, it's not always a physical thing. We have to acknowledge the soft power dimension. For example, in Gate, the Japanese state needs and wields a neoliberal apparatus. They can fight things better than the people in the Gate. They bargain much better. They're so much more powerful and capable than these people in this other world. But as you mentioned, there's a particular fetishization of modernity. For example, in Juisa no Oshikoto, it's modern veterinary information and practices that give him the leg up. Or, you know, when we look at Isekai Yakkyoku, it's modern medicine that gives him the leg up. 
that he literally has to propose germ theory in this other world. And it can get really insidious in the context of simulacra. Consider Isekai Hote, right? where the god wants Japanese law in this other world, and yet god is so comfortable bringing over a failed law student instead of an actual lawyer. God has somehow decided that it doesn't matter that he failed. What matters is that this man knows Japanese law, this man who happens to have killed himself, and that is meant to be so fundamentally superior to native law, and you can see how it starts to brush between Chthonic laws and the laws imported from Japan. Yeah, <laughs> and they decide to uh, to install this Japan law system, even if Japan law is not so absolute and perfect, right? Even if we talk about gate, we have a supremacy of, of army, but of knowledge too. And they decide a lot of things, like uh, you need to uh, distribute condom to a prostitute, you need to uh, bring food to the civilization, educate the people. They act like, you know, USA in Iraq. But there's something really interesting about Gate when you look at the rhetoric that it uses, because there's a particular political bent that seems to be quite ominous. This is quite an important question, because it recalls discussions on the GEA CPS through a cooperative with Japan as the guiding vector of a new order, we can establish a system completely aside the Western-built liberal one. And that's quite a damning sentiment that runs through a lot of isekai. We control or manage these peoples, but they're barbaric peoples, the things we give are cultural, technological, what have you, and you're going to like it. Only when you've become enlightened by our reasoning that real cooperation comes forth, but it's almost always by the reasoning of the Japanese subject. And that's uh, remind me of Break Company, where uh, the main character is like choose by the government because is like the ultimate otaku and are uh, transported to another world discovered in the Fuji tree sea, yeah, right? His purpose is to sell otaku culture to another world, to bring culture to this world who has absolutely no culture. Like they describe it like stone age of culture. And for spread this culture, his first move is to build a school because the British can't read or write and they need to learn Japanese. And in his school, they don't learn their own languages, but the languages of their invaders. Even the main character asked his employer, he said, am I an invader? And he, he questioned that, he, he, he can fit in his guts, it's not really okay to make this. And uh, he tried to find a, a way to make his job, but uh, evade this kind of invasion to bring kind of salvation to this new world where they need to destroy the, the wall of inequality and bring them liberty because they don't have it. It's a world with a lot of different races, so we have elves, dwarves and stuff. Like the usual uh, MMO package. <laughs> he decided it's not okay to have this kind of difference and according to his valors, he decided to destroy this, this world and it brings chaos and problem to this world because they are not accustomed to, to this and no one questioned that even if in the at the beginning of the stories we have a, a terrorist attack in the school and we have a extremist uh, royalist uh, who are anti-imperialist people who want to uh, kill him because it brings over culture to their world and they see it like an invasion because it's not their culture and he destroyed the, the actual society with his move. So it's not like in Gate where you like it, it's genuine, it's pretty, uh, even if it's clear. 
for us, for the main character, it looks like it don't look like an invasion. He really think he's here to serve and protect. He's a soldier and he act like this. He don't question the order. But the main character of Outbreak Company is not a soldier, so uh, he questioned this and he interrogates his, his own feelings to find the, the right things to do. <laughs> And so this kind of reminds me of this one isekai, Nihon Koku Shokan, where the entire nation of Japan is transported. And I think it imbibes a lot of these sorts of tenni conventions, the defensive postures, the politics, the connection between material and immaterial objects. For instance, the country immediately procures food to ensure that it doesn't starve to death, which is actually quite important because Japan is actually at its lowest self-sustainability. But an incident leads to war. And eventually Japan does get involved as an overwhelming military presence. And it's important that the war is over food, right? Because there's a lot of isekai about soft culture, power, and food. And it sort of betrays a really particular imperial reasoning. Food is power. And Japan has a lot of history about food and cooking culture. That's uh, we have a lot in common uh, uh, between friends in Japan is uh, our love for food and all we treat are de la table. We have a kind of you know a ritual way. It's a cultural element which is uh, really intricate to politics of, of the cool Japan. Like if you talk with someone in the street and you want to talk about Japan, you. You say that what's the first thing to come to your mind when you say Japan? 80% sushi. There's something about isekai shokudo that's really interesting, and that is how the Japanese person always seems to be the decider of an assemblage. For example, early on there's this character who's considered to be this incredibly savvy and inventive merchant, but it turns out that his empire was built off the work of the Japanese chef. <gasps> It's resources from one world, but it manifests differently through efforts of another. And that's the same in Isekai Nobu, right? This world has eels, the, you know, the resources. But it's up to the Japanese to figure out how to actually make it palatable. And so there's a sort of resource anxiety in that Isekai maps out this sentiment where the imperial power must acknowledge that their resources depend from this other place. But it's through the imperial power and their ability to quote-unquote wield it so much better than the natives that it legitimizes their use of those resources. In Isekai Ruorido, the main character doesn't bring the food with him. He uses the food already there to elevate it beyond the native cuisine, or according to the story, the lack thereof. It's only through us Japanese that the food elevates itself. And yet, at the same time, it also has to have to deal with this very post-war liberal order that it's been inculcated in. It uses the language of imperialism to draw attention to the fact that it rejects its own imperialism. Even if he cooked occidental food, like beef stew is not really Japanese meal, because it is a Japanese chef, it's better than any other cook. We have the superior culture, we are here to educate you and we are far better than you. And in even some of the stronger isekai, right, in Tondemo's skill, one of his powers is that he can purchase things off Amazon Japan, that their power is one of nearly unshakable logistics. He became rich to uh, with selling salt. There's a part of it based off of historical accuracy, right, that people went to war for, but it's used to legitimize a kind of power relationship that loves to favor the Japanese. And in the previous video, we talked about how isekai have really interfacial preferences. And so we can see this really show up in food, because isekai, and naroke in particular, draw upon games as storytelling cruxes, and we can see how games actually play a really critical role in power relationships in food and resources. Because not only are the women treated like resources to mimic party creation, but the foods are treated as items, giving buffs and bonuses like they would in games. And again, the asymmetricality of this relationship rears its ugly head. The women seem totally okay with it, reasoning that their slave owner isn't as bad as the other native slave owners. 
and the food is so much better when cooked by the Japanese because notably the Japanese cook is the one who makes the buffs. So in these sorts of resources, when a Japanese man cooks it, when a Japanese man enslaves, and when a Japanese man goes to war, everything is so much more seemingly moral and refined. And so we have this melding of game logics with this resource anxiety. But the reason, right, is because they're the ones who create the rules. It's an imperial logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in Takarakuji, the Yonjuku, when you give them a kid's pitch, it gives them super strength, a really good endurance. And when it eat it himself, it don't make a difference. So it's like a, it's much better food like them. It's, uh, it's like a, a drug. In Isekai, food is not only a fuel, it's more like a knowledge, a, a leverage in this new world, a way to gain power, literally and economically, you know? As an example, you can talk about the reverse Isekai Boku no Eyaga dungeon, where the main character had his door connect to another world leading in a dungeon and when he used the food of his world in it, he gained a kind of buff, so when he drink cola or eat chips, he gained some power, endurance, strength and such. For the economical part, you can use an example which I really like, Tondemo Skill. In Tondemo Skill, the main Kara became rich by selling salt, table salt. From our world, in the medieval fantasy world, where salt and pepper are pretty difficult to find and refine, and salt is an essential tool for food preservation, right? All of this tend to lead to a pretty good ascendant in the fantasy world, see? Where you need to hunt to feed you, but that's not all, because it becomes more interesting when we don't talk about only food, but also about cuisine, which is the same but with cooking food. <laughs> cuisine is a whole new world of possible where food is mostly the same steak, but also a vector of nationalism. When you had an isekai with a guy who can stop war by creating noodles or soy sauce, you can legitimately ask where did it go wrong? <laughs> food in isekai is mostly a source of power. It's a characteristic of cool Japan, so it's entwined with the politics of Japan. You can see it well in the adaptation of Isekai Izakaya Nobu. Well, it is an anime about cooking, so it's wholesome. But even in its structure, the show is to made a life part with a cuisine tutorial, the way the character eats and be so happy to eat Japanese food, which is never can be compared to the peasant feeding without delicacy, you know? Food in Isekai is nationalism incarnated in a rice bowl. Obviously, this conversation presupposes consumption is a relationship in which the Japanese person always has a leg up or they always produce things that are always better. But they don't always do that, and they can't always do that. So let's get into the heart of darkness and talk about Isekai, where the main theme isn't creation or control, it's about devoration. Next time, we're going to talk about isekai that have a very particular sort of relationship with the world in which they've been sent to, where the idea to grow is to consume.